Hi hey everyone, it's Matthew here. Don't mind the noise in the background, that is Co-op Live being built. But of course that means I'm at the Etihad campus, I'm on Joe Mercer Way and behind me is the Etihad Stadium. Now if you followed me closely, I've spent just over four and a half years building this in Minecraft, on and off. Um, so with that in mind, I'm very happy to be able to show you. It's my most ambitious project to date. And of course, I've done the whole campus true to style. So, yeah, with that, let's get into it. Despite what many people like to say about Manchester City, they do have history and a lot of it. Tracing its origins back to 1880, the club was formed as an offshoot of the cricket club originally founded by Arthur and Anna Connell of St Mark's Church as a way to get young men away from the scuttling and gang fighting in the Gorton area of East Manchester. This team, known then as St Mark's, West Gorton, initially played their home games on waste ground near the church, with the first game being a 2-1 defeat to the Baptist Church from Macclesfield on the 13th of November 1880. Following a brief merger with Bellevue in 1884 and a name change to Gorton Association soon after, the club would eventually leave for their new ground at Hyde Road in near nearby Ardwick, becoming Ardwick AFC in 1887. Officially, the club during this time was run out of the Hyde Road Hotel after striking up a good relationship with the landlord there, Stephen T Chester's Thompson, while at the same time renting their home ground at a rate of £10 for seven months. The first game was supposed to be against Salford AFC on the 10th of September 1887, however the plans went out of the window after Salford no-showed the event, presumably meaning Ardwick won by forfeit depending on how rules were in the 1880s. The club also became professional at the same time as their move to Ardwick after it was decided to award a single player five shillings for his services. Following an explosion in the nearby coal mine two years later in 1889 which killed 23 miners, a friendly was played between the club and Newton Heath, who would go on to become Manchester United. Things for Ardwick looked to be on their way up following a first ever Manchester Cup win in 1891, beating Newton Heath 1-0 in the final, and eventual admission into the Football League's second division in 1892. It was under Joshua Palby that the club would be set for its final name change. In 1894, with the argument that despite both Ardwick and Newton Heath, the two Manchester clubs being in the second division, neither carried the name of England's second largest city. The club would thus change its name to Manchester City, a name chosen to represent all of Manchester regardless of social status, background or place of birth. Billy Meredith signed for the club the same year, dubbed the Welsh Wizard by his admirers and was one of the best players in the country during his time at the club. He would help City to promotion to the first division in 1899, scoring 29 goals in the process that season. As the club's first golden age drew drew to a crescendo, Tom Maley was appointed manager prior to the 1902-03 season and following their relegation the previous season, City romped to the second division title before beating Bolton Wanderers 1-0 at Crystal Palace to lift the first FA Cup the following season. However, it would all collapse like a house of cards following the 1904-05 season after the football bribery scandal erupted. Meredith was accused of bribing an Aston Villa player to throw the final, final game of the season a move which would have led to City being crowned champions. Following an FA investigation, Maley and the former chairman were banned from football for life, two directors were suspended for seven months, while 17 players were then banned from the playing for the club again, Meredith among them. The heavy fine incurred by the scandal meant City were forced to auction off their players to cover the cost. Many of the most talented players such as Meredith, Herbert Burgess, Sandy Turnbull, and Jimmy Bannister ending up at United and would go on to win the league the following season. The club would eventually relocate to Moss Side and following City's move from Hyde Road to Main Road in 1923, the club was once more on the march. Post demolition, parts of Hyde Road were sold off, with some of the old roofs still in place at the Shea in Halifax, while the site of the old ground is now a bus depot. Unlike Hyde Road, the opening game at Main Road actually went ahead with City beating Sheffield United 2-1 in front of a crowd of 58,159. After scoring 31 goals in five matches en route, City would also reach another FA Cup final in 1926 against Bolton Wanderers, a reverse of their 1904 meeting. 
City ultimately lost 1-0 courtesy of a David Jack winner for the Whites who gained their second FA Cup in three years. This misery was compounded at the end of the season as City were relegated from the first division. Another second division title followed in the 1927-28 season and after the club's second FA Cup victory in 1934, City would eventually win the first division title in 1938 with the team featuring the likes of Sam Cohen, Eric Brooke, Frank Swift and Fred Tilson. Unfortunately, City set an unwanted record as they became the first and only reigning champions to be relegated the following season. It is thought that this is where the moniker Typical City first began. In the post-war period, City secured another second division title and returned to Wembley under Les McDowell for the FA Cup final of 1956, where they faced Birmingham City in front of a 100,000 strong crowd. Two notable squad members that day included future Leeds United legend Dom Reavy and former paratrooper-turned goalkeeper Bert Troutman. The German keeper by this stage was popular with the fans after an uneasy introduction to life in England, but during this match he would break his neck in a collision with Birmingham striker Peter Murphy. No substitutes were permitted at this time, so Troutman continued on against medical advice, as City would win 3-1 before he was then serenaded with a chorus of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow by the crowd after the full-time whistle was blown. City would experience another golden age during the late 1960s following the appointments of Joe Mercer and Malcolm Allison along with the emergence of the likes of Colin Bell, Mike Summerby and Francis Lee. After finishing 15th in the 1966-67 season, City would upset the odds by being crowned champions the following season. They followed this up with the 4th FA Cup in 1969 and a European Cup Winners' Cup and League Cup double in 1970, beating Gornick Zabza 2-1 to win the former and then beating West Brom 2-1 at Wembley for the latter, with goals from Mike Doyle and Glyn Pardo, the grandfathers of current City player Tommy Doyle. Following this high point, the City went on the decline following first the resignation of Mercer in 1972 and then the departure of Allison two years later. There was a brief period of stability under Tony Book in the mid to late 70s, a spell which included a famous game at the close of the 1973-74 season, as City beat United 1-0 to send the Reds down to the second division. If that wasn't bad enough for them, Dennis Law scored the winning back heel to relegate his former employers, subsequently retiring once the season ended. After a poor spell and a managerial merry-go-round in the 1980s, City got themselves back to the first division by the time the Premier League was founded in 1992, with the Blues being a founder member. Things only went south from here, with City ending up in the third tier of English football by 1998, despite having a team including the talents of Georgic and Cladzi. It seemed to be this predicament that lit a fire under them, after a Paul Dickov inspired victory over Gillingham in the playoff final the following season, got them out of Division 2 at the first attempt, with City securing back-to-back -back promotions by finishing as Division 1 runners-up in 2000. City were finally back at the top table. After a single season in the Premiership, Joe Royal City were relegated back to Division 1, only to return as champions in 2002 under Kevin Keegan. Despite the rebuilding of the Kipax in 1994, it was clear that Main Road was nearing the end of its life, with the only option being to move stadium. In a case of perfect timing, Manchester had been awarded the right to host the 2002 Commonwealth Games and would be building the main stadium on the site of the former Bradford Colliery at a cost of £112 million. The final design proposed by Arup, who would also serve as structural engineers on the build, called for a 41,000 seater venue, with a double tiered east and west stand and a temporary seating section to the north, while the roof was innovative for its time. A toroidal shaped roof suspended by a tension cable net system which is attached to 12 pylons around the stadium's perimeter, eight of these pylons also helping to serve as access points for the stadium's upper tier in a manner similar to the ramp seen at Milan San Siro. A larger version of this design which would have seated 80,000 people was initially proposed for Manchester's failed bid for the 2000 Summer Olympics. Following the Commonwealth Games in 2002, in order to prevent the stadium becoming a white elephant in East Manchester, it was converted into a football stadium, with the intention being that Manchester City would relocate there before the 2003-04 season. This involved excavating the internal ground level and removing the running track to create a third tier of seating, while the temporary stands were demolished and replaced with a permanent north stand, all for a combined cost of £40 million, which was partly funded by Manchester City Council. However, due to a surplus being created by the Games, 
the Manchester Regional Arena was created alongside the stadium for around £3.5 million. With a top 10 finish in the Premier League assured along with possible European football, a crowd of 34,947 witnessed the curtain fall on Main Road in May 2003, with the typical city moniker rearing its head once more, as the Blues lost 1-0 to Southampton. After 80 years, Kevin Keegan's city were finally moving back to East Manchester. Following a series of mid-table finishes in the years following the move to Eastlands, including the drab years under Stuart Pearce which saw David James play up front, and the club record an unwanted league record of scoring just 10 goals at home in the 2006-07 season, with none scored after New Year's Day, the club accepted an £81.6 million offer from former Thai Prime Minister Taksin Shinawatra to take over the club in June 2007. While this period started well with former England boss Sven Goran Eriksson brought in as the new boss, a loss of form midway through the 2007-08 campaign compounded by an 8-1 defeat at Middlesbrough on the final day meant that Eriksson was out of the door. It wasn't long before Shinawatra was gone as well as his assets were frozen, leaving City skint and on the brink. However, on 1st of September 2008, everything changed when the club was bought for a fee of £200 million by Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed Al Nayan under the guise of the Abu Dhabi United Group, with Manchester City now the richest club in the world. Mansour's friend and advisor Khaldun Al Mubarak was installed as chairman. The recently appointed Mark Hughes was retained as manager, but it cannot be said the owners had no ambition with the club beating Chelsea to the £32.5 million signing of Rubinho from Real Madrid in the final hours of the transfer window, a British record transfer fee at the time. A £100 million attempt to sign Kaka from AC Milan was rebuffed the following January, but eventually the stars would arrive in the form of David Silva, Yaya Torre, Mario Balotelli and Carlos Tevez, the latter moving from rivals Manchester United which prompted the infamous Welcome to Manchester billboard. The noisy neighbours were the noisiest they'd been in some time and United were now on notice. With Roberto Mancini, or Bobby Mank as he's affectionately known as in charge, an FA Cup win in 2011, their first silverware in 35 years, along with the 6-1 hammering of United at Old Trafford meant the tide was well on the turn in Manchester. It all came to a head on May 13th, 2012. United were away at Sunderland and needed a result, while City hosted a relegation threat in Queen's Park Rangers led by former boss Mark Hughes. City had to match or better United's result to secure the title. QPR also had their own task, take one point and survive or hope Bolton didn't win. Despite Pablo Zabaleta putting the Blues 1-0 up, typical City threatened to bite again after two second half goals from Gibral Cissé and Jamie Mackey set the Premier League title on its way to Old Trafford. Then, the unthinkable. With United having won 1-0 after a Wayne Rooney goal and with two minutes of added time gone, Edin Dzeko buried a David Silva corner to level the tie, with a Sergio Aguero winner coming on 93-20 to gift City their first Premier League crown on goal difference and first league title since 1968. Despite the result, QPR also survived after Bolton were held in a controversial 2-2 draw at Stoke City and were relegated instead. The comeback title win from 2011-12 has gone down as one of the greatest moments in Premier League history. After conceding the title to United the following season, incoming manager Manuel Pellegrini would overturn an 8 point deficit to lead City to their second title in three years during the 2013-14 season along with the League Cup. He became the first manager from outside Europe to win the Premier League but despite reaching a Champions League semi-final in his final season, the club would only manage a second League Cup win by the end of his time in charge. Pellegrini was replaced by Pep Guardiola before the start of the 2016-17 season and was widely tipped to win the league that season. However, things did not go to plan and after going through a trophyless campaign for the first time in his managerial career, an overhaul that summer saw the team romp to a 100-point tally and the league title in the 2017-18 season, a season now dubbed the Centurions, by fans and pundits alike, with City being the first to hit that total in a campaign. City have continued to set records alike since, and after critics doubted Pep Star would work in English football, he has proven them massively wrong, and the Blues reached their first Champions League final in 2021, falling just short to Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea, with Kai Havertz scoring the only goal. The line, some were born here, others drawn here, but we all call it home, 
became synonymous with Manchester when it was read during a vigil for the victims of the 2017 Manchester Riverina bombing. But it also struck a chord with Guardiola, who had the words inscribed around the wall of the club dressing room to serve as an inspiration to his band of largely adopted Mancunians and remind them of the club they play for and who they go out to represent. It was in Pellegrini's last season as manager that the record attendance was set at the Etihad Stadium on February 6, 2016, when a crowd of 54,693 saw the Blues lose 3-1 to a Leicester City side, rampaging towards their unthinkable title win three months later. Following further developments of the stadium in the last few years, the capacity currently sits at 53,400. However, given the stadium is in a ball formation, there are, in, there are no individual figures for each individual stand. Plans have been in the pipeline to expand and redevelop the north stand in a similar fashion to the south stand, which if completed would see the capacity increase to 63,000. As for the academy, Manchester City formerly trained at Carrington between 2001 and 2014. In 2011, plans were drawn up to build a £200 million complex on the derelict land surrounding the stadium, which would include a state-of-the-art youth academy and training facility, of course, now known as the City Football Academy. This is just one small portion of the wider Etihad campus, with other aspects including Connell Sixth Form College to the south, named after the club's founders, and the co-op live development to the north. A 23,500 capacity arena currently under construction with a planned opening date of December 2023. Since its opening in 2014, the Etihad campus now serves all age groups from the under nines right through to the first team, while at the same time forming an integral part of the club's ambition to develop homegrown talent. The women's team was also formally merged into the operation in 2012 and has since gone on to achieve great success in the women's game while the Academy Stadium also serves as the headquarters for the wider City Football Group. Work to build the Etihad in Minecraft initially began on November 22, 2017, while work was still being done on the University of Bolton Stadium. However, as other projects took priority, the stadium became largely neglected, and after a brief revival towards the middle of 2019, the decision was finally made on July 16, 2021 to restart the entire project. This time though, I plan to make this my most ambitious build ever, while at the same time hoping it would be one of the best stadiums ever built. Inspired by French builder to Top Top and the work he did with Lyon's Group Armour Stadium, I decided I would go all out and include as much of the wider Etia campus as possible, while at the same time keeping the amount of detail in the build that I've become known for over the years. In an improvement on what I had started on Xbox, I decided to build the stadium in a more organised fashion, starting with the lower tier and working upwards. And as a result, the roof was on for the most part just six days later on July 22nd. By September, nearly all of the exterior structural work had been completed aside from the south stand expansion, which I was able to build more or less in a step-by-step -step method due to the images I was able to obtain of its real-life construction. The stadium was topped out with the completion of the masts on September 2nd, with the completion of the north stand itself following three days later. By this stage, work was happening on the build most days of the week, hence the speed at which the stadium progressed. As a result, the Etihad Stadium itself was declared structurally complete on September 22nd, and thanks to images I managed to obtain on a stadium tour in early October, Work on the interiors was able to progress at pace, the stadium as a whole being finished in the live stream on January 1st, 2022, nearly six months after the build was restarted. Following this, work on the wider Etihad campus began and was divided into two phases. Phase one encompassed the immediate surroundings of the stadium and would stretch as far as Manchester Tennis Centre to the north, while phase two would cover the CFA. After four months of work, Phase 1 was completed on April 30th, 2022, with Phase 2 being completed three months later during another live stream on July 16th, exactly a year since the restart and finally bringing an end to the four and a half year long project. As always, I have added a download link for this map in the description below if you'd like to have a look around the campus as you wish. And with that, I hope that you enjoy what is left of the video and let me know in the comments what you think. As always, like, share and subscribe and I will see you all next time.